All right, folks, so now we're going to talk about filtration. Well, actually, we're going to talk about uh, uh, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about all three, and we'll start with filtration. All right, so let me just, we already covered a little bit about filtration before. What it is is there's blood pressure in here. There's blood pressure in the blood, and that blood pressure is pushing solutes out into the glomerular space, the, or the, the Bowman's capsular space. The glomerulus is a capillary bed inside Bowman's capsule. It's pushing. Uh, so this is actually the glomerulus right here, this blood. This capillary is the glomerulus. And the blood pressure is pushing uh, water and solutes into the Bowman's capsular space. But there's a barrier to that. And the barrier is we have this endothelial lining, which happens to be fenestrated capillaries. Okay, so that fen the fenestra are are windows or doorways to go through, and those fenestra are about 90 nanometers across. And then we have this dense layer right here, or the basement membrane, and that's negatively charged, so that repels anything that's negatively charged. And then we have these filtration slits right here, and these filtration slits are about 9 nanometers diameter, so that keeps out anything that's, that's bigger than 9 nanometers. So you can see we have this barrier to filtration. And in part of this 26-3 and 26-4 is the driving forces of filtration. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's filtration. And anything that can make it across this filtration membrane ends up in the Bowman's capsular space and becomes our filtrate, which we then can modify. Now, what do I mean by we modify our filtrate? Well, here's our filtrate. And as it travels down the proximal convoluted tubule, the lupa henle, and the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. So what this straight tube, this the straight tube right here, it's denoting the proximal convoluted tubule, the loops of the, the ascending limb. I'm sorry. Let me go in order. It's denoting the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending limb of the lupa henle, the ascending limb of the lupa henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. So it's denoting all of that. Now what happens here? Well, what happens here is we reabsorb. That's the purple area. That means we take things that were filtered that are good for our body and we reabsorb them back into our body, back into the bloodstream. And you can see that, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure what purple and yellow is, why purple and yellow is different. One's probably water and one's probably solute. So water and solute, solutes are reabsorbed. And in fact, we reabsorb 99% of our water, just so you know. And how do I know that? You f make about 200 liters of filtrate a day. 200 liters. But you only make 2 liters of urine a day. That means you reabsorb 99% of that volume. You only make one, only 1% 1 of the filtrate you make a day comes out as urine. So we reabsorb 99% of this water and leave 1% in the uh, renal tubules. And we reabsorb solutes like glucose. I mean, we always want glucose back in our blood. We, we need it for energy, so we reabsorb that. Now, not only that, but not all the toxins and waste products and things like that are filtered. Some remain in our bloodstream, and we can secrete it, and the green arrow is showing you secretion. So just because it's not filtered in the renal corpuscle doesn't mean it's a lost cause that it has to stay in our bloodstream. We have the opportunity to secrete it back into our filtrate, which becomes our urine. So reabsorption and secretion are two events that, that, uh, that modify our filtrate that change our filtrate from the initial, from what it initially is at the Bowman's capsule. Okay, this is showing you some pathways for absorption, for reabsorption and secretion. Uh, we have this paracellular pathway, and the paracellular pathway goes between cells. Now, we have tight junctions here. Well, how the heck can we go between cells if we have tight junctions? Well, when you read your book, It'll say you have tight junctions, but they're weak. In other words, it's not the tightest of tight junctions. It doesn't make a complete barrier. 
So uh, we things can get in between the cells, and that's the paracellular route. Or we have the transcellular route. We can go across the cell. Now, the transcellular route uh, gives the cell a chance to modify what's being what's moving. So we have we have this transcellular and paracellular route. We do have a route that uh, can start transcellularly. And then, well, it's still transcellular. This red arrow right here is still transcellular. It doesn't matter if you uh, exit through the basement or the basolateral uh, part of the membrane. It's still transcellular. So we have this paracellular route and we have the transcellular route. Both water and solutes can take a paracellular route or a transcellular route. Now, uh, the paracellular route typically happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. Matter of fact, if you look right here, the paracellular route is particularly in the proximal convoluted tubule. All right, so those are two routes that things can take. Also, 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 notice that some of these transport mechanisms are active transport mechanisms. They require ATP. And some of them are passive transport mechanisms, which is osmosis and diffusion. All right. Now this picture, this is a really important picture in your book. It tells you a lot. So first of all, let me show you the key. The green arrow is filtrate. That's your initial filtrate. But our initial filtrate doesn't stay the same. We, we can reabsorb the blue arrow, reabsorb. What are we reabsorbing? The blue arrow is water. So we're reabsorbing water. We can also reabsorb solutes. All right. We can also secrete and that's the dotted arrow. If you look down here and you see the dotted arrow. No, I'm sorry. The secretion is not because it's dotted arrow. The secretion is because it's going back into our tubules. The dotted arrow means that it's variable. It's facultative. So the dotted arrow, arrow means variable or facultative. And that means certain things, chemical signals can control that. The Solid arrows means they're obligatory. That happens no matter what. All right. So you can see that most of our proximal convoluted tubule is pretty obligatory. We obligatorily reabsorb all this water and solutes. Now look at the descending limb of the loop of Henle. We have an obligatory reabsorption of water. Look at the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. We have an obligatory reabsorption of solutes. But then look at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. These are all dotted arrows. And we have reabsorption and secretion. So we have reabsorption and secretion, reabsorption, 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 secretion. And they're all dotted arrows, which means they're all facultative or variable. And they're under hormonal control. And matter of fact, the hormones that affect that are ADH and aldosterone. And we'll talk about them shortly. So this is the uh, nephron and the collecting duct, and you can see that we have obligatory reabsorption. We have uh, facultative reabsorption and secretion. All right. This shows you uh, the filtration of the renal corpuscle. I say 200 liters a day. Your book says 180. By the way, the only reason I say 200 liters a day because I can compare it to two liters of urine and I can do easy math and say 99% reabsorbed, 1% remains as urine because two is 1% of 200. I don't disagree with your book. I just wanted to do easy math. That's all. Notice this. Notice the proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs 60 to 70% of your filtrate. Notice the, the reabsorption um, in the nephron loop. Now, only the descending limb of the loop of Henle, only the descending limb of the loop of Henle uh, reabsorbs water, and 25% of the water is reabsorbed there. So if you add up this, take the high end of the PCT, 70% plus 25% is 95%. By the time your filtrate is at the bottom of the loop of Henle, 95% of your water has been reabsorbed. And you're, you're going to say, well, oh, we reabsorbed 99% of it. Yes, that means the other 4% is variable. Because this 95% is obligatory. We reabsorb. Let me go back. 
We reabsorb 70% of the water. Let me erase all this stuff. We reabsorb 70% of the water in our proximal convoluted tubule. All right, so we reabsorb 70% of the water in our proximal convoluted tubule. It's obligatory. It's not dotted line. It's, it's obligatory. We reabsorb another 25% of our water and our descending limb of the loop of Henle. That's 95%. That means this other 5% here, here, and here that's facultative or variable, or I should say 4%, this other 4% that's facultative or variable is under hormonal control. We may actually not reabsorb any of that. We might, we might not. We would make a lot of urine if we did that. It would, it would be, we'd have large amounts of, we'd have coat, uh, large volumes, copious volumes of dilute urine if we didn't reabsorb these variable ones. But this 4% is the only percentage that's under hormonal control. But by the way, 4% of 200 liters is quite a bit. So 4% of 200 liters? 0, 0, 8. 8 liters. You're talking about 8 liters there. I mean, hardly anyone urinates eight liters in a day. Now, some diuretics might make you do that, but that's you're talking about a lot of volume of water. So, of the four percent, even though it's only four percent, you're talking about a lot of water under hormonal control there. All right, so that's that. The distal convoluted tubule. This stuff is all under a hormonal control. Look at this: ADH, aldosterone. All right. The collecting ducts, that's under hormonal control, ADH, aldosterone. You can see the hormonal control for the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts there. All right. This is showing you the filtration again. So this is the filtration. And here's your filtration membrane from here to here. These things are 90 nanometers across, then you have a negatively charged dense layer or basement membrane. It's negatively charged so it repels anything negative like proteins. And then you have a 9 nanometer slit right there. And if they don't fit, if they're greater than 90 nanometers, they don't even get through the fenestra. And then if they can get through the fenestra, if they're greater than 9 nanometers, they don't get through the filtration slit. And if they're negatively charged, they're repelled by the dense layer. But if they can get through here, they end up in the Bowman's capsule right there. That's where they end up. Now, what drives this filtration forward? And the answer is the major driving force forward is blood pressure. That's the blood pressure. Sometimes we call it glomerular pressure. All right, so we got blood pressure or glomerular pressure. Your book is calling it glomerular hydrostatic pressure. GHP is blood pressure equals blood pressure. All right. Now let's say our blood pressure is 50. There's our blood pressure. That's 50. Well, what are the forces counteracting this blood pressure pushing, pu pushing the filtrate out? What are the counteracting forces? Well, first of all, I have proteins inside here, these blue things. And these exert an osmotic pressure. And it's called blood colloid osmotic pressure. And the main reason for blood colloid osmotic pressure is albumin. Why is that the main reason? Because albumin is your major plasma protein. It's the plasma protein that's in highest concentration. Albumin is the major dra uh, drawing force for blood colloid osmotic pressure. That that has an inward osmotic pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury. Remember, your outward blood pressure was 50 millimeters of mercury. So, so far, net, with just these two, you're gonna, you have a filtration pressure of 25. However, you also have a capsular hydrostatic pressure of 15. I mean, there's pressure in this Bowman's capsule. You're putting fluid in there. There has to be pressure in there. So you have a capsular hydrostatic pressure pushing back in as well. And let's say that's 15. Well, 25 and 15 is 40. So, in other words, I have 40 millimeters of mercury pushing back in. And I have 50 millimeters of mercury pushing out of the blood. So, who wins? Well, 50 wins over 40. And that's a net of 10. So, my filtration pressure would be 10. 
all right? And I would filter. I would make urine. I would make filtrate, and that would be modified, and I would make urine. So I would filter right here. But do you see how important blood pressure is to normal kidney function? Because that's not a big difference. My filtration pressure is only 10 millimeters of mercury. What if my blood pressure dropped to 40 millimeters of mercury in my glomerulus? Well, now I got 40 pushing out and 40 pulling in. I have no net filtration. I don't make any urine. There's no. Is there filtration? Yeah, but there's also it's also being pushed back in by pulled back in by blood colloid osmotic pressure and pushed back in by capsular hydrostatic pressure. So I don't have any net filtration, and that's not good because now all the waste products stay in my blood, and um, I m might need dialysis. So blood pressure is very important for normal kidney function because of that. By the way, you need to do be able to do that math on the next test. You need to be able to look at these driving forces of glomerular filtration and do that math in the next test. All right, what's the regulatory, what's the regulation of this? Well, first of all, our juxtaglomerular apparatus is involved. So let's start right here. Let's start where it says start. We have a normal glomerular filtration rate. The GFR is 125 mils per minute, just so you know. I'll, I'll show you how we calculate that. Just memorize that for now. Glomerular filtration rate, 125 mils per minute. You can uh, calculate that in the lab. You can take a 24-hour urine and, and calculate GFRs. There's a couple of assumptions, but uh, they're minor assumptions, and it's pretty accurate. All right, and by the way, usually it's a 24-hour urine because it's more accurate than a, than a random urine collection because how much volume you give in any given snapshot of time with a random urine collection is not – you can't – what are you gonna? What are you gonna do? Assume that you did that ten times a day? Are gonna assume you did that eight times a day, twelve times a day? So you have to make too many assumptions with a, a random urine collection. But if we send a jug home with you and we say urinate in this jug for the next 24 hours and you keep it in your fridge, and I know it sounds disgusting, but that's what we do. You bring it into the lab the next day and we can calculate a bunch of things. And uh, some of you might have done a 24-hour urine before, and, and you indeed do keep it in your fridge right next to your lemonade. All right, so here you have a normal glomerular filtration rate. What if our glomerular filtration rate is decreased? Well, it better not be decreased too much. We won't get rid of the, get rid of the waste products, all right? Well, there's some auto-regulatory events that go, go on here. First of all, we can constrict our efferent arterioles. So if you have an afferent arterial going in, A is for afferent, and you have a capillary bed called the glomerulus, and you have an efferent arterial, arterial coming out, E is for efferent, and I constrict this, I make this very narrow, it's hard for this blood to leave the glomerulus because my efferent arterial is constricted. So blood, so uh, blood pressure builds up in my glomerulus, increased blood pressure. That itself increases filtration. Back here to the math. If I constrict my efferent arterials, this number 50 could go up to 60. Now I'm favoring uh, a net filtration pressure. So one thing I can do is constrict my efferent arterioles. That's an auto-regulatory event. Another thing I can do is contract my mesangial cells. Now let me just remind you what the mesangial cells are. They are the cells with the gap junctions in between the uh, juxtaglomerular cells and the macula densa cells. All right. The contraction of these mesangial cells will increase the glomerular pressure as well. And the last thing I can do is I can dilate my afferent arterioles. Here's A for afferent. If I dilate my afferent arterioles, I reduce the friction of blood entering my glomerulus, so I increase the flow of blood into my glomerulus. Plus, I'm decreasing the flow out of my glomerulus because I constricted my efferents. My glomerular pressure goes up, my glomerular hydrostatic pressure goes up, and I favor a net filtration. This returns me back to our normal GFR, and I get rid of waste out of my blood. Okay, so that's the autoregulation, but we have some hormonal regulation going on. What's the hormonal regulation? Well, let's look at this. The JGA, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, secretes renin. It secretes renin when it detects a low blood pressure. So, first of all, you have a decline in blood pressure. You secrete renin. 
Renin acts on angiotensinogen to convert it to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is a mild vasoconstrictor and raises blood pressure. Meanwhile, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by an, an enzyme found in the lungs and other places, and that enzyme is called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is a more potent vasoconstrictor, and that raises blood pressure. In addition, angiotensin 2 goes down to the adrenal cortex and tells a mineral corticoid to be secreted. That mineral corticoid is aldosterone. I increase aldosterone secretion. Well, aldosterone secretion goes to the kidneys and says uh, reabsorb more sodium. What reabsorbing more sodium does is water follows the salt and I increase blood pressure. I increase blood volume and therefore increase blood pressure. Meanwhile, angiotensin 2 goes to the brain and says, you are thirsty. I drink. I increase my water intake. Meanwhile, angiotensin 2 goes to my brain, my hypothalamus, and increases antidiuretic hormone production. The ADH goes to my kidneys and says, reabsorb water. That increases volume, which increases pressure. So all of these things together increase blood pressure so I have an adequate net filtration pressure. In addition, I increase my sympathetic motor tone. And my sympathetic motor tone constricts my, uh, well, I haven't talked about this yet, but I will shortly. Uh, my, symp my sympathetic nervous system increases my heart rate, so it increases my cardiac output. That increases my blood pressure. All right. It also constricts, I have venoconstriction. There's a, there's a blood in your veins, most of the blood's in your veins at any given time, by the way. But if I constrict my veins, I push that blood out of my veins. So I, I'm, not, I'm not reserving as much blood in my veins anymore. And more of it's now found in my arteries. And that increases my glomerular blood pressure. So I constrict my, I do venal constriction, I constrict my veins, and that puts more blood into my arteries. All of these things bring that blood pressure back to normal. This is called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This is a collage showing you we have local autoregulation and we have hormonal regulation, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This is another picture showing you the, uh, the same thing. This is really showing you the same thing. Here's renin, here's angiotensinogen. They're going directly to angiotensinogen two, angiotensin 2. You know now that it actually goes through angiotensin 1, but they're, they're simplifying it and making it go to angiotensin 2 directly. So don't worry about that too much. They're simplifying it. Uh, so this is really showing you the same thing here.